Hello, welcome to Harvard Game Devs. My name is Ruby Khan. Today I'm going to be talking about collectibles. I'm going to use Super Mario Odyssey as, as an example. My personal experience playing through and actually 100 percent of this game. If you guys don't know what Super Mario Odyssey is, it was a really popular game that was released really last year for the Nintendo Switch. And it was like the new mainline Mario game. The ambition was to create a game in the vein of Super Mario 64, a sandbox platform where we jump around, have fun, and collect stuff in the open. So it's not a linear game. That was the whole game philosophy. Now, I want to tell you about the main collectible in that game, which are called moons. See, the joke is, is that they're usually called stars in Mario games, but they, uh, they call them moons to be clever. Uh, so in the game, they are 880 unique power moons. They're 880 unique collectibles in this game. That's a lot. That's a huge number. In fact, it sounds great on an advertisement if I wanted to sell the game to someone, which I think is why they came up with that number. I don't know why they didn't go to the full 99, uh, which you actually can do. You can spend money and get extra moves. Um, so, but basically they're 888, and that sounds like a lot of content, right? It's like, man, these levels are chock full of such glorious adventures. Uh, um, so, I find four major problems with the moon system in this game. And I'm gonna go through them, like, one by one, and you will see how the four of them combine to make moons so uniquely frustrating and addicting, and why I think it was made that way, and why I don't think it's good game design. I, I, it's not something you should try to do in your games. So the first reason is the way moons are used in the progression of the game. So to progress to the game, you go to a level, um, you, have to, you have to get a bunch of moons to get your ship to go to the next level, and then, and then, and then. So for example, let's that screenshot, the little thing I put on the top, right? That's what the UI says. So in that example, Mario is one moon, and you need to get like 16 moons or something to get to the next level, right? Well, to fill up all the spots, you can go to the ship and go on. But maybe there are 25 moons in the area. So here's the fun, fun, fun fact about this whole system and why I, it just makes no sense. If I get 25 moons here, it means nothing. If I got 30 moons, 100 moons, or 16 moons, it means I go to the next level. And in the next level, I do the exact same thing. I start with zero, and I have to get to say nine, or 14, or what have you. So every single extra moon I collected, if I only care about progressing the game normally, is an utter waste of time. It earns you nothing. There is no reason to get it. So unless you're going for 100%, or you just want to like get more moons for the feeling in your heart, it's just, it's just actually worthless. And that makes no sense. Other games do it way better. Jack and Daxter, for example, uh, moons from every single area count together. Previous Mario games did this correctly, like in Mario Galaxy, where the stars from any level counted towards an arbitrary total. Even Super Mario 64 did it in a way more sensible way. So what the game communicates to me here is that the first 16 moons in this level is good, every other moon from then on is worthless. And this whole idea of, of the game telling me that the moon is worthless is a really constant theme, especially because of the post-game content. After you beat the game and you go through all the levels linearly, all it does is add this moon block and you smack it and it adds more moons to the area. Not harder moons, just more moons. Sometimes there'll be a moon just sitting out in the open. In other words, there is no benefit from collecting more moons than the required amount other than the, the, the very fact that you get more moons. There's literally nothing. There's no reason to collect them. That's the first problem. There's no incentive to collect moons other than the required amount. So here's the second reason why I think moons are bad in this game. So lo look at that. The moon is sitting out there on the lake shore. That's what it's called. So many of the moons in this game are literally worthless. They, they're, that's not real content. It's copy-pasted content. For example, in one level there's a moon literally sitting out in the open. It's just like you just walk up there, it requires no skill to get, and that's one out of 880 of the content in this game. Um, for example, there's one moon, there's this one moon type you have to get rid of. You go to a dog, and you play fetch with it for like maybe over three minutes. It's very tedious. And you have to do that eight times in the game. There's one thing that is really awful to do, and you do it eight times, and it's basically the same challenge. And you will find that even that 880 moon sounds really impressive. There are basically only 20 different types of ways of getting moons, and they're just repeated again and again and again. So in my opinion, there aren't 880 moons, there are probably really like 60 moons in the game. It's, it's not, it's not, there's nothing more interesting. Very few moons offer unique challenges. There are areas that offer unique challenges, but they are so few and far between based on moon count that it's honestly disappointing. Um, so, moons being left out in the open, 
terrible. Okay, so I want to argue that the game tells me that each moon is worth a coin. So in Super Mario Odyssey, coins are everywhere. When you die, you lose 10 coins. Uh, coins are so cheap, they're just thrown at you for doing nothing. It's pretty sure it's actually impossible to beat the game without collecting any coins. So I'm going to argue that a moon is worth a coin in the game's logic because of something called these rocks that in the game. I just call them rolling rocks. Where you can walk around, you, you readily walk into a rock, it appears off the ground, you kick it a couple times, and it gives you a coin, right? Except for two cases where it randomly gives you a moon. Now you have no reason to know that a rock in the ground can give you a moon or a coin. It's, it's free action, it's meaningless, it doesn't give you anything. But sometimes it'll give you a moon. So at one time I did one thing and I got a coin, and I did the exact same thing another time and I got a moon. So that communicates to me as a player that these moons equal a coin, and a coin is basically worthless in this game. So the fact that there are so many challenges that arbitrarily give you moons, when on the other hand they can also give you coins, or purple coins, or literally nothing, or maybe like, you know, a, a better vantage point or something, proves to me that in the game, moons are so arbitrarily distributed that they're also basically worthless. Um, and that's like a huge problem, in, 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 like if you want to make a good game with good collectibles. So I'm going to pick up a game which I don't think is a, is a great game, but it does collectibles right, which is Donkey Kong 64. I don't know if you guys have played that game. Please don't. Um, I 100%ed I, I it. I enjoyed it, but it's not like the greatest game in the world. But that game does collectibles right. The way it, the way it puts them after unique challenges that aren't just endlessly repeated or put in really arbitrary, stupid locations. And that's the problem with having 880 moons with over 75% of them just being worthless. They could replace three quarters of the moons in this game with a coin, and I don't think they would lose anything of significant value, which is really tragic. Um, finally, I'm going to show you this video I found on the internet. So whenever you collect a moon, there's a little animation that plays, like, ooh, you got a moon. You might have seen it if you've seen the video of this game before. Yeah, so someone spliced it all together, and it's one hour and 12 minutes. So I 100% of this game, so I, so I, I, I watched 100 and, one hour and 12 minutes, of straight, you got a moon cutscene in my life. I could, have, I could have done something in that hour. Like, think about what you can do in an hour and 12 minutes, okay? But no, I sat there watching this freaking cutscene like a, like, like a complete moron. Uh, and it's very humiliating to me, personally. But, so, I'm going to talk about the quantity of moons and why that's ridiculous, okay? I, I already said earlier that most of the moons in this game are essentially repetitive tasks that you do once and you do it maybe eight or nine times. For example, I think there are over 50 moons where you just see a patch on the ground, you walk up there, ground pounded, and it's a moon. But there are many other patches on the ground, you walk, you walk there, ground pounded, it's a bunch of enemies or a coin. So the fact that, that I, that there's that much content stretched out over time with this excessively long cutscene goes to show that all these moons, the real purpose they exist is just padding. I genuinely think that the reason there are that many moons is just purely to pad the game. Um, so, uh, so, and, and it makes no sense to me why they would pad the game, because there's so many easy ways to solve the problem. For example, you know, these are moon patterns, you know, half moon, crescent moon, it's a very logical thing to think of. Why could they make some of the really easy, obvious moons to get, turn them into crescent moons, make them one-fourth of a moon, right? Or make some of the hardest moons be worth two moons, and actually have some variance between the, like the, like the, the very easy, like, super simple out of the open moons versus the ones that are really hard to get, or require actual challenge. And you know, the game actually has moon shards, which are these things where you collect five of them, you get a moon. And honestly, the moon shards are hidden with the same kind of effort and the same kind of like skill required as a normal moon. It's so arbitrary. It, honestly, the fact that, they, that this, this is something they played with and they did use, like screams to me that there's a different alternative motive behind why moons are the way they are in the game. Uh, so you can see that's what a moon shard looks like. Um, honestly, if you, if you replace this moon shard with a normal moon, I would not be surprised. Like that's that, that's how this game works, uh, it, which is ridiculous. Um, so I've been really hard on Super Mario Odyssey, and uh, for good reason. I actually really liked the game. Uh, I 100 presented it. So I, I enjoy the levels. I enjoy the enemies. I thought it was the capturing mechanic was very cool. I just detested the powers of uh, the the collectibles. Powers were okay, and that's and that's because I realized something when I was playing the game. This game was not meant for me. You know, I played Super Mario Galaxy, that was a great game. But Odyssey was not meant for someone who played Super Mario 64 when they were a kid and they grew up on the video games and the nostalgia crowd, right? This game was meant for children. Like, honest to God, I think it was meant for children who were like between 8 and 12. 
Because there's no reason why you'd give such repetitive content for doing such non-actions again and again and again and again. So it's like why people will watch the same episode of, TV, of, of a TV show again and again and again when they're young. So the, the fact that so much of this game isn't a real challenge, but it's just literally doing nothing and getting rewards, screams to me some kind of like, honestly, like some kind of psychological hacking of your own behavior. Um, and it's not great because it worked on me. I guess I am a child at heart. But yeah, whenever I saw that cutscene, you know, I walked over there, saw Moon in the Open, I'm like, oh my god, that's a, such a cool collectible. I ran over there, grabbed it, and you know, played the little scene saying, you got a moon for 10 seconds, and I felt happy, I felt good inside, you know? You know, I, I couldn't go play Breath of the Wild and get destroyed by stone monsters again and again. Or I could play Odyssey, walk over there, see a moon, and you know, get rewarded, make me feel good, right? So these are the two reasons why I think moons are so are used in such a, honestly, not a great way in this game. Number one, to pad it out, because the levels are not that big. They just aren't. Uh, and the second reason is to just make you feel good, want to keep playing, and it, it's, it's not a real challenge. There's, it's just, there's, no, there's no substance to the game, unfortunately. Uh, not to say that you need substance to make a okay game. I think this game is fun. It's, it's a fun, fun game to play. But it just very, has, it's just very insubstantial. And that's what I think about that. Now, before I end the presentation, um, I actually want to hear what you guys think about what I said. And, and has anyone ever played Super Mario Odyssey? Um, okay, good. I, I, I hope I didn't turn you off from the game forever, although I'm pretty sure I did. Um, so I'm sure someone here has at least played a, a video game with collectibles, uh, like a platformer. Um, so do you think you could maybe share why you found the collectibles so interesting? There are a couple of the points I want to bring up, but I want to hear what we have to say. So like, a uh, platformer can include anything from like a Mario game, to Shovel Knight, or pretty much any game with a collectible, like a collectible item. Yes? Well, I played uh, Super Mario 64, and I remember like some stars in that game were like really hard to get. Like, you had to like basically do a mini quest to like get them, so it was like, it felt like, uh, so, how many stars were you in Super Mario 64 level, you think? Maybe like 8. Yeah. So imagine if instead of that level of 8, it had 40, uh, and one of the stars was just like on a platform in the very beginning. Right? Like instead of doing a quest, that quest gave, gave you 4 stars on the whole process of doing it. Like each step gave you a little star. Uh, that's basically what this game does. It's, it's basically, I feel like you. Yeah, it's basically that. Like, super, you, could, you could say, Super Mario 64 is 800 stars, right, by like doing that kind of technique. Um, but why, why was a star important to you? Why did it feel meaningful? Did it feel meaningful because I played a fun little cutscene? Well, I was just, like, really bad at games. So, <laughs> like, ever, anything that I could, like, do was, like, more, like, to actually be able to get, like, to beat the level. So, how do you think you would feel if that star was, like, 10 times easier to get? Maybe I would start off better, to be honest, because I would have been able to get more of them. To finish. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. So, yeah, so that's, that, that's, that's I think, I think that's the philosophy of this game, right? Because cause yeah. I think it, it prays to that kind of uh, notion that, you know, doing things are easier. Now, I might sound like an old man saying, ma, video games these days are too easy, or, you know. But. I think that there's, I think it would be more memorable for you, the fact that you remember struggling for a, for a single collectible that would have more meaning, rather than getting 80 on the process of, of just getting it handed to you like candy. Yeah, Sam? Yeah. I guess going um, again off the Super Mario 64, I played the 3D, uh, sorry, the DS remake. Oh, so I'm so sorry. Really, it, it, was, it was fine, I was young, so I didn't really care. Um, but one thing, well, but this, like, about the, but this is also applies to 64, so where you talked earlier um, about where only the moons you collect in a particular area, like help you get to the next area. You can't go back and get more and access and do whatever. But like what C four does is because you can collect it from any area, it allows the player the opportunity to go back to a level they maybe really, really enjoy and like try to get all the stars in that area and maybe like not as many in an area that maybe they don't as like as much and might just in general give them allow them to have more of a positive experience with the game. Every single star you collect is meaningful. Yes. But in this game, if you really enjoy kingdom coming for stars, your actions are meaningless. They don't progress the game, not even one bit. So yeah, it's very tragic. Uh, yes? Yeah. 
Um, can, I, can I ask, I know, uh, I might guess it's something that's already been uh, addressed, but like, so you just said that one of the real issues, well, the issues that you have with, with the Mario Odyssey is that some of the stars, moons that you collect, don't have like the same impact that every single star has in in 64, right? Or any collectible game, honestly. Okay, and, and what 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 is like frustrating to you about that? Like, what is missing? How does that take away from the experience? It does. See, here's the thing. It, I don't think it actually takes away from the experience. It just makes you feel empty inside of the game. And that's not what you want from the experience. It's not unless what I that's the experience you're trying to craft. Unless. Yeah, I, I I said earlier why I think it was made that way. I, I think it was it was it was made for for for, for children and people. Like to just get rewarded again and again and again for doing very little effort. And I don't think it's something we should be encouraging in video games, at least from a philosophical standpoint. My, my issue with moons is purely philosophical, honestly. <laughs> it's not, like, even from the gameplay perspective, it's not great, um, it's not good, but it's not awful, it's not, it's not terrible. It's just very, it's, there's no substance to it, there's no reason. It, it, it honestly feels like a trick. It feels like I was, it feels like I was told there'd be 880 moons of content, and I was really just given, you know, a hundred moons of content and seven hundred moons of garbage, right? Which is which is I, honestly, I think most of these moons in the game would be taken out and nothing of value would be lost. It would just be you just did copy paste an asset here and there. Yes. Is Donkey Kong sixty four the one with multiple colored yes. bananas? Yeah. Okay. It's interesting how you bring that up because I feel like that um, has been addressed in other places to have the opposite problem, where a lot of players were frustrated because a lot of those collectibles were like, rather than even challenging, sometimes you had to like go back to a base just to change a character. Very tedious, yeah. It, it was tedious, yes. Um, what do you think is the happy medium? Because I feel like if Super Mario Odyssey has too many coins that are easy to get, Donkey Kong 64 has too many bananas that are hard to get. It's not hard, they're just tedious to get, it's like a waste of time. So, what is your happy balance? So, what I would say is that, okay, if I want to put Super Mario Odyssey on the right end of my spectrum, where it's like, just throw the moons at them, like, you know, it's a moon vending machine that costs zero cents to operate. And then the other side is Doctor 64, where, you know, if you want to get this one banana right there and a string of red bananas, you march all the way to the beginning, turn into Donkey Kong, get the yellow banana. I think they're both tedious. They're just tedious in completely different ways. This is tedious because all your actions are meaningless and you get nothing from them, right? It's just there to make you feel good, to play that. What was it? It was, a, it was a minute, it was an hour and 12 seconds, Hour and right? 12 minutes. Hour, hour and 12 minutes of this one cutscene. Uh, and on the other hand, it's just you running back and forth to areas that you're not making, there's no, that's not real gameplay in my opinion. It's just, you're just backtracking, which is why I'm actually not super confident on backtracking. I think a great example of a happy medium is actually Jack and Daxter. I think that game does it really well, making collectibles meaningful. Because each collectible, each collectible that you collect in that game goes towards some goal, Right? And a majority of them are hard to get and useful to get. A, a, a majority of moons in Super Mario Odyssey are both useless and not fun to get. They're, they're just there. So I think if you can make sure, if you can take all your collectibles in your game, all the major ones, and you sort them out, and you say how many of them are useful for the player to get, and how many of them are actually unique, fun, interesting to get, and if you can strike a balance between that amount, like the ratio compared to the rest of the game, then I think you got something good. It doesn't have to be a majority of the collectibles are, use, are useful or good. Just a significant amount of them. Like, Odyssey is a great example of what not to do with collectibles, in my opinion. And I said they could have easily fixed it if they just made some of those moons, like half moons or quarter moons. Or, it, would be, it, would be, it, would, it would be an easy fix, and they already had a system in the game for that. So it's, it's honestly very... Like, I think they made the active decision to, to not do that. They probably had a discussion about it, and now it's better to just inundate, inundate the player with, with all these collectibles. Especially since you have 880 of them, by the end each moon is so worthless. Have you played um, Ori before? I have not. Steam? I have not. That's, I think that's like an example of like good uh, collectibles in a way, uh, yeah. because it's sort of like every like orb or something that you collect, it's like you get experience from, and then that like levels you up, and then you can get an ability. And so it's sort of like adding to two aspects: one, like sort of character improvement, but also um, also adding to the story because like you can also collect like oh 
yeah, you can collect like map pieces that expand the zone of play. So maybe, I don't know, I think it's really interesting kind of getting a little bit philosophical here, but you're basically asking like, or asking the question, you know, how do we create value in collectibles? Right? Exactly, that's my question. So it's like, it sounds like based off of like some of the questions and conversations that I've started that, that it's a matter of like the challenge of the acquisition, right? How do you, mm -hmm. what is the challenge you get? The sort of um, unique content and actions like the mechanics of getting it, I guess, or um, and potentially a connection to the story or like larger arc um, flexible acquisition. So kind of cutting down the tedious this, you know, the tedium of just like doing the same action over and over again, and potentially like this idea of like a useful function of whatever you collect, right? That's a great four list summary, yeah. <laughs> four points. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think, well, I think it's an important question too because you're saying like, well, we shouldn't make games that have useless collectibles, right? And like, what does that do if you're playing a game that is presenting all these uses collectibles, like especially as children who are very impressionable, right? Versus having a game that has more like challenging or nuanced collectibles. I don't know. So it's very interesting to brought up uh, Ori because it's a Metroidvania, right? Mm -hmm. So like that's the kind of genre it is. So there, the they'll have an actual story, and the collectibles will enhance your character. <laughs> and a platformer, um, especially a Mario game, where they want you to not have your character change at all, I understand why they didn't have that. Like that's fine. Um, I'm just saying, like in previous Mario games, the collectibles are meaningful because they unlock new areas um, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And in this game, the collectibles really just don't do much. So the question is, if I'm making a game where the collectibles don't add to the story, which I think they should in a story game for sure, mm -hmm. and the collectibles don't enhance your character, which I feel like they should, uh, even some platformers have, you know, collectibles that enhance your character, um, then what's the point? Like, is it to unlock new costumes? Is it just to get the completionist? You know, you can't rely on the player desire to, to complete or explore to get the collectible. They need, they need to have a function. I, I do think the function is very important. Um, but yeah, that, that, that four point list is a great way to sum up why we should be encouraging people to collect things in your game. Because if it's, if it's doing none of those things or only one of those things, then what's the point? Yes, Sam? Um, um, At the same time, some people don't want to collect things necessarily in games. You know what I mean? Like sometimes I people saying. just kind of want to push through and finish. And if you have those extra collectibles for the completionists who desperately want to have that challenge that they can say, yes, I, I completed this entire game. You know, I feel like useless collectibles are meant for certain people, not necessarily for the general audience. My concern with that is that I gave you an example of that one kingdom that had 16 collectibles to get. <coughs> And you say you, you want you say say you're a player who's gonna say, I wanna to get to the limit and then move on to the next level and I'm done with the previous level. First of all, I don't think that was experience the, the developers wanted you to have because these levels are really fleshed out and they keep stressing in the marketing that it's all about exploration, exploration, this, exploration, that, exploration. But on the other hand, if you're collecting those sixteen moons, you're just gonna go for the easy peasy trash moons. You're not gonna go for the interesting hard ones to get. You're just gonna say, Okay, I'm gonna do a little evaluation. Uh, and then I'm going to get the easy ones. There's a great quote by, I think it was a developer on a, a Dota, I think so. He said, if there's one thing you can trust a player to do, they will op they'll find a way to optimize the fun out of a video game, which is a great quote. Because I think people do that. They optimize, they optimize the game to optimize the fun out to try and win. And I think that's, that's, what, uh, that's what people will just do. They will just get the trash, horrible goons, and they'll get a really terrible experience. They won't get a better experience. Like, I'm just saying, this, the way they set it up is not very intelligent if they're trying to get a good, wholesome experience, and the goal wasn't to just inundate you with rewards. If the goal is just to make you feel good, they did a great job. So for the player who does want to just get to the game, I think they should still do ensure that they, they can't just optimize their way out of the fun. I have to look at that quote, it's a good quote. Yeah. So the issue um, for me with the, um, the collectibles that don't really mean anything, um, sure there might be like certain players that um, want to complete it just for that, but like from personal experience, like I think part of it, um, part of like 
going into Mario Odyssey, I had the expectation that like the collectibles meant something. Oh, did you play this game? I did. Yeah, I beat yeah, it. Did you beat it? Do you hundred percent or no? I did. I had like three hundred to five hundred stars. Oh, like interesting. Me. This is stupid. So right? It's so. It's just. It really. Ugh. But, um, <laughs> 300 to 500, that's a huge range actually, that's so hilarious. Like, I can't tell you how frustrating it is to sort of like search for all the moons in one place and have the map tell you you've got, have you know, the parrot and stuff tell you you've got two more moons in this place or, or whatever and then you get them all and then like later in the game as you progress like more moons unlock in previous levels you could go back and like get additional oh, moons. And those moons aren't even harder to get, some of them are literally just out in the open. It's, it's like it's, it's so pointless. But just coming from the like 64 and whatnot where each moon did something um, and that aside just having like a general kind of like like completionist sort of like mentality or, or like I just want to make sure I've checked all the corners in case there's like a, a secret direction or something that I'm, that I might miss. I don't want to miss that, right? Um, so I, I was somewhat compelled to want to get the moons just because I was uncomfortable with the idea of not um, of not having like gotten all the moons, it just felt messy to me, right? But the moons didn't serve a purpose, and so I found myself doing this thing for almost nothing. And it wasn't, it wasn't that enjoyable. I was in this weird sort of state where I was playing the game because, in part, I enjoyed it, but also I was like trapped in this sort of like I'm gonna play the game, but I'm not having a good time, but I'm still playing it uh, kind of scenario. Do you think when you collected the moon, it made you feel like you can't want to play? Excuse me. When you collected the moon, did it? It was like relief. It just, it wasn't even like a sense of achievement. It was like, thank God I didn't miss this goddamn moon. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine if you thought that way about the stars in 64 or Galaxy? That would not have been a great game then, right? No, no, it wouldn't. And so I, I, I don't consider this game like one of my favorite Mario games. You know, really it wasn't the, the vibe we were going for, but like, I just think it was important to address, right? That, uh, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. It's gonna, it's gonna conflict with certain certain people like me who, you know, who just want to feel like they've gotten, like, complete experience, and, you know. I like how you called it a sense of relief. That's a really great, good way of putting it. Something, at least important to me, when you talk about the philosophy of making a video game is uh, the developer or the designers often, what their goal is to, is to impart a certain feeling to their players, right? And when they're making this game, I don't think their intention was to impart that feeling of <sighs> relief after collecting a movie. I'm just so afraid I'm gonna miss them. It's just not. It's like give me one star to focus on, and like seven or something. Have a formula, uh, it, right? Just like it's clean. Get one star, not like search for a bunch of stars, and you don't know how many there are because it says you need thirteen or something. But then there are more than thirteen, and you don't know how many until you like, you know, beat the sort of like story component of the stage, and then more unlock. It's just, yeah. Uh, you know, the only reason I kept playing, to be honest, is because the movement in this game is so good. It's very clean. So. It was just movement and camps are good, and that's the only reason I kept me playing. But yeah, okay, that's interesting. Any, any other comments? Sam? Um, actually, um, after I, you 100% Super Mario Galaxy 2? Yeah, of course. Yeah. The, like, the, all the 120 green stars? I like that. That was good. But you like that, really? Yeah. Well, I know. Why, I, why well, I like, love tedium in video games. That's sarcasm. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. But so okay. No, but I like I like I was thinking about I was thinking about that. They are similar though. They're yeah, similar. Like, I, I find eerie similarities. I think, and like part of the problem with there is like that they're all thrust at you at once, and there are no like check marks. Like like well, normally in the like, games you'll have like you'll get these batch, and then you'll have some sort of entry that mixes it up, and then you'll move on to the next batch. But when you have literally the same number of stars you collected the rest of the entire game thrown at you at once, it ends up being a similar problem. Do you, do you know why I liked those green stars? Why? Because I was a child. Um, yeah, so they're the same thing. It's very tedious. And in my second place of that game, I did not do the green stars. I just wasn't. I'm not going to do that. It's a waste of time. Um, but if you guys don't know what that is, it's basically when you beat the game, um, there is a comma that comes by and spawns three green stars in every course. And you can go there, and it's just the same old missions, but there's a hidden green star somewhere, and you can go jump for it. And it's usually not very well hidden. Some of them are very well hidden, so, dastardly hidden, yeah. but some, some of them are kind of out in the open, and it feels very much, it's 100% padding, and I can't respect padding in video games, I'm sorry, I just don't. So, yeah, it's a, I don't know what to say, like, it's actually a very similar thing, you're right. Super Mario Galaxy 1 did a way better thing. Yeah, they just the Well, see, what they did is they just, they just had to replay the game as Luigi. 
Oh, yeah. The, Which the, is technically better, I think, because they actually added the, stuff at the end. You love the movement, right? It was different. Uh, yeah, the movement, so, I like the move, Luigi's the movement point, a lot. The yeah. point of Mario 64 was we're not going to even develop the game until the jumping mechanics are fun in and itself. Right? So yeah, that, that's the one thing they have down. They, they make movement fun, and that's the only thing that kind of keeps them keeps them good. But, but what I think about the, 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 the green stars is at least it happens like after the game, right? It's not oh, really yeah, like, introduced the, yeah. during the goddamn like, <laughs> like Odyssey experience, right? This is like completely, like it's clear, this is optional, yeah. this is tedious. But if the there. main game was Green Stars, I would have just, I'm done. But I couldn't get to the last level. Like you can't get to the I don't need the last level. Last but level I is a bonus content. But I couldn't because I didn't want to go through the tedium. I don't, I, Sam, I don't even know if you could, could have beat the last level. It was really hard. <laughs> um, okay, Remy. Yeah. Was it actually very hard? Yeah, it was pretty hard. Was the last level in Super Mario Odyssey kind of hard? It was way easier. It's yeah, the shortcuts too was terrible. Yeah. It was hard. Like, yeah. It's okay. It's okay, Sam. It's okay, Not Sam. everybody is going to be successful. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. You it's know. okay, I have a Sam. question about the padding. So, like, I guess, at what, at what point does something become, some content become padding versus, like, how do you define that? Okay, I want to create, I want to invent a number called Q. Okay, Q equals the ratio of how much development time it took to make this idea versus how much how much player time you get out of it. Okay. If this ratio is like is like zero to if the closest ratio is to zero, the more more it is padding. Okay. That that I'm gonna define it like that. Okay. What? Okay, the 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 closer it is the further away it's, it streams from the average of a normal playthrough, that's the more padding it is. Oh. There it is, I fixed it. Well, I mean, there are AI-generated games such as, oh, what is it? Spelunky? Yeah, yeah, like Spelunky, where... I don't know, I feel like it took a lot of time to develop the algorithm. The guy wrote a book about it, I'm pretty sure. He yeah. explained this, it took him a while. Okay, my definition was somewhat facetious, but you understand what I'm saying. Like, if you can, if you can just take, like, for example, say I make a game, right? I can just take all the levels I made and just, like, add a green star and I double the playtime. Like, the first Crash Bandicoot game, they added boxes and gems, doubling the playtime, and it took them, like, literally, like, a week, okay? A week of a development in a year-long game, and they doubled the playtime. It's so efficient. So it's the most efficient way to increase the runtime of your game is just pad everything. And, I mean, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of padding, because you, 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 you want to have the players play for longer so they can get more money's worth. But equating, like, the problem is I feel like we, as I call it psychologically, equate playtime with kind of the money we got. Like for example, a fallacy people say with the Paradox games, like a game like Eve 4, where like one of my blockmates is over a thousand hours in that game. Um, wow, this, this is not great. Um, and, uh, and the game was only 40 bucks or whatever, like did, did you get your money's worth out of that? Versus say Undertale, which you could have, like for example, Undertale is $10 and I get 10 hours out of the game. Eve 4 is $40 and I got a thousand hours out of the game. So which is more valuable? It's really, it's, it's up to the person. Exactly. My understanding, right. there was like basically no padding in Undertale. There's no padding I, I, I and they could have added padding. They no, could have doubled it. And that was, that was I really haven't played so, it, but I know enough. It was new concept <laughs> after new concept. They valued my time. They va it's, it's also, how much do you value your time? How much the game developers kind of respect you, too? Right? If, if so, it's like this if, game disrespected my, my everything, so. It, it wasn't, still play like it wasn't their attention, but I don't know, maybe children have more time or something. So it's like, the person who put a thousand hours, you know, into that game, it's like, how much do you value your time? Like, is that hey, something hey, you want to spend your time? I have three hundred hours in EU4, don't How many? I'm like, actually, I think I have four hundred hours now. It's a good game. It's yeah, a great game. Yeah, like, you, you know, just know what you're getting into and think about, like, potentially the opportunity costs, right, that go along with it. So. You know, this discussion on padding is really interesting. Maybe someone should do a, give a talk about padding if they, hmm. if they are very... It's just pursuing this topic further. I can say, like in in like anime, when I used to watch that stuff, like padding is just the worst thing. Right? It's Especially just like, TV like filler, episodes. filler episodes of anything uh, is like it's an offense to my time, <laughs> and like it really it, it's, it, it, it's it's like a. It's like things like Facebook or something where they, it's also an offense on your time because they have people who like design the site to keep you on it as long as humanly possible, even though you have other things to do. Right, so sort of like their desire to keep you on the site goes against like your interest, like your self-interest in like doing the things you have to do, your homework, the other components of your life. It just 
like fundamentally seems like a disrespect. In, in shows and games, perhaps that's not like directly the intention, but still like the fact remains, it's just like. Well, in some games it is the intention, like that's the entire mobile development yeah, market, right? The goal is to get you addicted and spend money, you know? It's, like, I think, I think Odyssey is Nintendo being a, it's a I, I think, I don't, I'm not choosing this game of being predatory, but I'm saying this game is the beginning of, I think, we're gonna start seeing more games that, that psychologically hack your brain in ways that don't produce good games, but just make you keep playing. I, I think there would be an impact on sales. You know, at, at the end of the day, like, the, the games that people highly, highly recommend, like Undertale, are That's the ones true. that, you know what I mean? Like, like so sure, tons of people will still buy Mario, but, like, I, I do think it has some sort of impact on sales, which is why they, like, I just think they were trying to be innovative. They were trying. Well, sales isn't, like, I was talking about earlier, you know, Mario Party 8 outsold Portal 2. You what? Know, Mario Party the 8th, the 8th Mario Party. that piece yeah, of fun garbage? Fact, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sales. Sales. Is, I might be wrong. Actually, double check me. I'm pretty sure I'm correct on that fact. Though. Well, I mean, like, there's a lot of people who enjoy trash entertainment. Like, that's okay. Mario Party's great. The new one. I mean, Mario Party eight. Eight, eight, was, not eight and nine and ten. Those were terrible. Right? Yeah, they were. Like, they, we those were disasters. Goddamn cart together. Oh well, nine and ten. Yes, disasters. But eight. The, don't. Yeah, do I might that. be confusing eight with nine, Kendall. <coughs> eight is weak. It's like, <coughs> I think it's like the standard. Yeah, that's Mario Party 8. Guys, have you tried Super Mario Party? Yeah, yeah, yeah I actually yeah. got that yesterday. It's good. I played it's good. in my dorm room with them. You should play it sometime. Yeah, for sure. All of us. Like All right, <laughs> so I think we're kind of getting off topic, yeah. which means I think we're done for today. Unless, do you want me to Just one last comment, just throwing it out there. Have you played a Hat in Time? I have not, because they, they did not make it for Switch or Mac. Okay. And I'm a scrub, so I only have those. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, just reflecting on the terms of what you were saying makes a good collectible, making everything matter. Matter. Um, yeah, a lot of their collectibles, like one type actually progresses the story. Another type, like there's some fun ones thrown out there for those who are completionists. And I feel like going into completionists and speedrunners is like a whole new category because it's like a different way to play every game. Um, but just throwing that out there, especially with the growing indie scenes, a lot of these indie developers are past gamers who have been growing up with Super Mario 64, who have been growing up with like all these other better games that people refer to to be better, such as like Banjo Kazooie. Um, first match, Banjo Kazooie, first match. So, um, in the end, I don't know. Um, just throwing that out there. It's an indie game. Maybe if you yeah. want to take a gander. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, Ukulele had a similar problem, actually, I think, to this game, in my opinion. U ukulele had its problem with collectibles, but it was in a different kind of way. But I know Hat in Time basically nailed it, from, from my impression. Uh, they got it down pat. But I also, I also think that, so like back to my thesis is about this presentation. I think the reason, I think they marketed a Hat in Time to people who cared about what I cared about. And I think Super Mario Odyssey, since it was marketed to the common, like the mass market, they, they like I actually think this game was, like, was made this way. This is on purpose. This is not an accident, right? These people are too in, in, intelligent and have too much money to make mistakes that, that this massive on a whole game design like, scale. So I think it was, it was made to make me feel good. So yeah, it, 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 the indie game scene is great because they, they can market to specific segments of the, of the population who like certain things. So, Professor, you can get the last word before we wrap things up. Uh, she should also get a word. I should oh, say real quick right. that it, this sort of, I wonder if foil's the right word. Like, Super Mario Odyssey felt like a foil uh, to like Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Oh, Odyssey. yeah, for sure. That's you have so this true. really yeah. deep, you know, RPG, like, for, like RPG 4, you know, uh, Switch. <laughs> for, for, for more hardcore oh. gamers that was also like magically able to to appeal to the uh, mass markets, right? But like that was the deep, the deep, uh, intricate like um, Nintendo game, and then you had this uh, Super Mario Odyssey for the for the casual masses, right? You had the hardcore gamer game yeah. and the masses game, sort of. And, and I don't know. They're both exploration games made on the Switch in a year where Nintendo made a lot of money. Um, so they are actually weirdly, a lot of similarities between these games. I believe they're even developed at the same time. Um, <coughs> 
kind of like how the original Legend of Zelda and Mario were made at the same time. With a lot of team, team overlap. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, uh, so, you want to say something about Yeah, no, I, I kind of, I'm interested in this idea of the collectible because I feel like um, when you mentioned padding, like, I feel like it's possible to introduce like a, something to the game that is padding, but maybe do you think there's potential for, let's say, uh, a collectible to actually make padding something worthwhile in a way? Like, I, I feel like, like the collectible has a way, if it's designed well, Right. To almost make padding not seem like padding. That's true. I wonder if like, what your thoughts are on that. I mean, there are good examples of padding, I think. They're good padding. Like, for example, a great example of padding, the ultimate example is adding a hard mode to a game. Right? It doesn't take a lot of effort to change a game up to make it a lot, but you can get a completed experience. Like, for example, Fire Emblem games, you add lunatic mode. You, you, all you literally just do is change a bunch of numbers. It's literally it. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it's a completed experience. So I think as long as the collectible and the padding work together to create a genuinely different experience mm -hmm. that isn't just what you did before, I think the padding is justified. Like the three, those green stars in Galaxy 2, it's not a different experience. It's just like... Well, it's a different experience, all right. Yeah, but, <laughs> but like, it's different from, say, like, uh, like the Comet missions, which are, again, they, take, they retake the same level, but they add something the different. The Comets are cool. The comets, comets are cool, but that's cool. also padding. Super cool. Yeah. So I, I, think, I think the main difference between padding that's good and padding that's bad is that it has to add a different experience. It goes back to my idea that you should, that you should impart certain feelings onto the player. And as long as those feelings are different and unique than what the original section did, then I think that's good padding. All right. Okay. I think we're running out of space on the SD card, so we're <laughs> there.